You walk into a doctor and the bad news is confirmed. You have cancer and it's probably terminal. You're told that you can have chemotherapy, which might work, but there'll be serious side effects. You say, no thank you. I'm gonna live the rest of my life to the full, spend it with my family, no chemotherapy. The doctor says, actually no. We really think you need the chemotherapy and we're gonna give it to you anyway, by force if necessary. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? That's, ju that's just wrong. Uh, it's up to us whether we have medical treatment or not, no matter how serious it is. Isn't that just a fundamental right? Well, for most of us it is. But for people with serious mental illnesses, this can happen all of the time. They say no to medical treatment, but then they get it anyway. The reason for this, the legal reason, is that if you don't understand the nature and effect of a decision that you're making, the law says that you don't have capacity to make that decision. Legally then, someone else can make it for you. Whether or not that's right, that's the way the law works. So, if this happened to a person who had capacity, the situation that I said at the start, they could sue the doctor. The doctor could even be charged with a crime. A person with a mental illness though, who's found to lack capacity, can be treated against their will. So this legal concept of capacity has a profound importance. It separates out legal from illegal. Now, talking about legal concepts, most people here know about guilty versus not guilty. In fact, you probably know quite a bit about it. You know that guilty means proving something beyond reasonable doubt, and that not guilty doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't do it. Most people probably don't know that much about capacity though, and maybe you should because how it works raises some very difficult but important questions, like why is it that a Jehovah's Witness can refuse a blood transfusion even if that will result in their death, but someone with a mental illness can't refuse medical treatment? And we should care, because this could be anyone. Every year, one in five Australians experiences a mental illness. Over a lifetime, the rate is almost one in two. Now, we would never allow somebody without a mental illness to have forced medical treatment. So why do we pick on those of us who do? Why is that okay? Isn't that discrimination? Doesn't that interfere with people's rights? Well, these are tough questions. And over the last decades, there's been a big rise in opposition to this part of our legal system. There's been a big rise in concern for autonomy, freedom of decision making. And there's been a lot of people with direct experience of the mental health system who've said, no, we need to stop forcing people to have treatment, whoever they are. Give people the decision-making power over their own bodies. And these perspectives are incredibly important. No matter how much good we might think that it does in the long run, we have to acknowledge that getting forced medical treatment is always awful. It's always a violation. And it's not good enough just to say, well, they've got a mental illness, it'll do them good, they need it, there's nothing to worry about. There is something to worry about. But we need to stop and think from the other perspective, what would happen if we stopped this involuntary treatment? What would happen to those people with mental illnesses who said no to treatment for their illness, and here's the thing, Maybe they said no because of their mental illness. If we stop treating them then, aren't we giving in to the illness? Say the person with clinical depression who says no to treatment because as she's clinically depressed, she can't imagine that the treatment could work. Or the person with schizophrenia who says no to treatment because his schizophrenia makes him think that the doctors are trying to poison him. So we have a dilemma. Treating people against their will seems wrong. But not doing it seems wrong too. And this dilemma brings us to the heart of the problem of what are we doing here? What is the point of our law and policy for people with mental illnesses? Seems like it could be about two things. Is it about their protection, protecting people from the effect of mental illness? Or is it about autonomy, freedom of decision making? 
Whichever you think it is, you probably think it needs to be either one or the other. It can't be both, because those two are incompatible. But I'm not so sure. It's such a common human tendency to think that something is either this or that. But I think if we think like that here, that's when we get into trouble to explain. Only thinking about autonomy can lead us to places that most of us would be uncomfortable with. Three years ago, the British Parliament had an inquiry into their Mental Capacity Act. What they heard was that social services, some local health authorities, had been purposefully using a part of the act which was supposed to protect autonomy in order to stop treating clients who told them to go away. Not, by the way, in order to protect these people's autonomy, but in order to save money. What happened to the people they stopped treating? Well, we don't know. But we know that without social services, without treatment, some people with serious mental illnesses can have pretty awful lives. Homelessness, prison, death. Is that what we want? So you see that thinking about autonomy can actually lead you somewhere which is callous and inhumane. On the other hand, as we saw, the critics of forced treatment also have a point. Throughout our history, very bad things have happened to people with mental illness, all in the name of their protection. So what's the answer? I think that we need to think about autonomy and protection at the same time. Every time we make a decision about someone and to say how that could work. Firstly, I think that it means if you do understand the nature and of effect of a decision that you've made, whether you've got a mental illness or not, and whatever that decision is, that decision should always be respected. So we do respect autonomy, but we also acknowledge a role for protection. And I'm gonna tell you about a way that that can work. It's called risk relative capacity. And to explain how that can work, let's think about somebody with a serious mental illness. Call him James. James is a young person, he has schizophrenia. James is in hospital and a doctor comes to do a routine blood test. And James says, I don't want it. The doctor asks him some questions and finds that James knows something about blood tests, but doesn't seem to fully understand what they're for. Does James have capacity to make that decision? Well, this is not a risky decision. He doesn't need this blood test. It's not gonna hurt him if he doesn't get it. So we don't need to expect a high level of understanding of James before we'd say he has capacity. In fact, we don't even need to assess his capacity. Let him decide. Another doctor comes to James and asks him if he wants to participate in a medical research trial. And James says, yes. The doctor asks him some questions and finds out that James understands something about medical research trials doesn't seem to fully appreciate what this one is. Does James have capacity to make that decision? Well, medical research trials can carry a level of risk. So in that case, it's okay for us to make sure that James does understand what he's getting himself in for. So we can assess his level of capacity against the level of risk of participating in this research. So maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, we need to check. Sometime later, James is in hospital again. He's been in a car accident. The doctor comes to him to do a blood transfusion and James says, I don't want it. The doctor asks him some questions and James seemed to understand what a blood transfusion is but doesn't seem to fully appreciate the situation that he's in. The doctor knows that he'll probably die without one does James have capacity to make that decision? Well, refusing the blood transfusion is a very risky decision. It's not complicated, but it's risky. In that case, we can expect and look for a higher, a better level of understanding of the decision from James before we would say he has capacity. Even though the decision about whether to refuse a blood transfusion is only as complex as the decision as to whether to refuse a blood test, 
our standard of capacity for the transfusion should be higher. Now, maybe James does understand. Just because he has a mental illness doesn't mean that he doesn't, but it's okay for us to make sure. After all, if we get it wrong and he dies, we don't get another chance. So that's risk relative capacity. That's how it works. If you think about it, what's going on there is you're balancing autonomy and protection in all of those decisions. Now, risk relative capacity is applied in our system at the moment informally to some minor extent, but it is not a part of formal policy and it's not a part of our legislation on capacity. And the reason is it's considered controversial and it's considered controversial because it adds an element of protection into a test that people think should only be about autonomy. But as I said at the start, it's when we only think about one of those things that we get into trouble. Now, you might think that what I described, that making this adjustment for capacity and understanding versus the risk of a decision, doing that every single decision, that sounds hard, it sounds tricky, it sounds difficult. And it is difficult because you're balancing two completely different things. But, so it should be. It should be hard to work this out because it's an incredibly difficult and complicated decision. Let's go back to criminal law. We spend weeks, months, sometimes a large amount of money on criminal trials to work out whether somebody is guilty of a crime or not. When we do that, we balance two completely different things. We balance the defendant's right for a fair trial and the people's right to justice. It's not an easy balance to make. Sometimes guilty people walk free. I think we need to accept that deciding capacity is also not an easy balance, but it's one that we need to try to do as well as possible. And if we can do it, if we can learn to balance our respect and care for people's welfare with a strong and constant respect for people's autonomy, if we learn to think about both of those things and always at the same time, we can make our system better. Thank you.